Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Well, welcome one and all to the finest movie news show in the entire galaxy here from balmy Burbank, California, in the house that can't be a built. I'm just trying to not trip the alarm. We are so excited you guys are joining us here today. Thanks to everybody who tuned in, not only to Collider Video yesterday, but also our Instagram feed, watching the Oscars with us. We have a whole lot of Oscar discussion as well as a lot of other cool topics in the world of movie news. Today for you, Ashley, who is helping me with this cavalcade of cinematic conversation? Also here, John Schnapp. I wonder if he's going to fade into the camera. Is it going? Yeah. So, so Monday dissolves, son. What's going on? Oscar Madness. Also here, Christian Arlott. Oh, you had it, but you blew it. What's going on? That's what she said. Oh, also look at you. here, Dennis Zen. Uh, we, before we get started with the regular show, we, we have some exciting announcements about some new programming, new shows, new videos that we're going to be having upcoming. Uh, uh, some that you know about, some you don't know about. Christian, why don't you talk about some of the ones that we do know about? Yeah, okay. So when last, I guess two weeks ago, when Mark and I had, had John made the announcement that we were coming over, the Schmoes were coming over, we announced a couple things that were going to be happening. One of those things was bringing back those commentary videos that we were doing. We're going to do two a month, and we're starting this month. The two commentaries that we're going to do, we're doing Empire Strikes Back. We're doing Return of the Jedi. Those will happen. It'll be myself. It'll be Ellis. It will be Schnapp. And we're going to try to get Campia as well to finish those Star Wars. But then we're going to do a whole bunch of other ones, and we need finish you guys. Finish what they started. We'll finish <laughs> what you started. And we got to make sure that you guys suggest. I know that the room has been suggested. Oh, yes. That's going to happen. What other ones? Comment right now. If you're doing live stream, what should we be watching in the commentaries? Also, we're going to be doing trailer reviews. We'll be doing about seven to eight of those a month. That's happening as well on the channel. Look for that. And then the ultimate Schmodown, that is going to happen. It looks like we're the John Campia and Dan Merle from Screen Junkies match will be one of the first ones we launch with. We got John Schnepp versus Finstock. We have Josh McCuga versus Clark Wolf. Their title match between Mark Riley and JTE. Um, and then Scott Mance versus John Roca. A lot of matches coming up. They're already booked. We're going to start shooting those really soon. And then we hope to debut. You that the end of March. So look forward to that. You know, Dennis, Campia versus Merle is a lot like the Revenant versus Mad Max. That's just, I don't know who to call. Um, and also, uh, some new shows you haven't heard about, we're working on. We haven't set a date yet for this, but uh, a weekly horror talk show. I, I know a lot of you guys have been asking for it. It's something in development. We don't have a firm date on that yet. That's in development. But the one I'm most excited about is this one. We've been work we've been talking about this for a long time, yeah. right? You, Christian, Mark, uh, you should even Schnapp, you, you know, everyone's been asking for this one. We are going to be doing a weekly Collider television talk show. Yeah. And we're going to, we don't have all the details, but we're going to do them on a Monday afternoon and recap. And if those do well, we might be increasing how, how often we see that. Yeah, we, we talked about it and it was like, you know what, the fans have been asking for for so long as far as us doing a TV talk show. So like, you know, every, we'll make sure that once there's so much TV news out there, so many, so many things that are happening. So we're going to make sure that we announce it when it's happening and we'll cover all the news and we'll make sure that you guys, things that you want to hear about, the topics that are happening in TV today, it will be going down once a week. Yeah, and that will definitely happen starting sometime in March, mid to late March. We'll get, we'll give you more details as it goes on. Mark, what, what's your input on all this stuff? I'm just very excited to get to work, and I don't like work, but all these <laughs> things are so cool that we're developing all this new stuff in March, and I think it's safe to say that in our office, Christian and I are going to combine our beds into bunk beds so we have more room for activities. Now, with all these cool announcements out of the way, Ashley, let's go ahead and talk about the Oscars a little bit. All right, last night was the 2016 Academy Awards, and the winners were a mix of locks with a ton of surprises. Spotlight won Best Picture over the favored The Revenant. Though it missed out on Best Picture, The Revenant didn't go home empty-handed. It won Best Director for Alejandro G. Iñárritu, Best Cinematography for Manuel Lubezki, and finally Best Actor for its star, Leonardo DiCaprio. The other big winners of the night, Best Actress went to Brie Larson for Room, Best Supporting Actor 
actress went to Alicia Vikander for The Danish Girl, and Mark Rylance won for Best Supporting Actor for Bridge of Spies. For Best Adapted Screenplay, The Big Short won top honors with Spotlight winning Best Original Screenplay. Inside Out took home Best Animated Movie. Mark, your thoughts on last night's Oscar winners? I'm really trying to manufacture being upset about Mark Rylance beating out Sylvester Stallone for that Best Supporting Actor win, but I, I can't get too up in arms about it because, Rocky, that legacy has been sealed for decades already, and it was added to with the greatness that was Creed. But Mark Rylance was fantastic in Bridge of Spies, so I don't want to take anything away from that performance. And everything else, as far as the major categories, I thought were fairly predictable. I liked seeing Leonardo DiCaprio win. I thought it was well-earned. It was fun watching the ceremony, seeing Mad Max get all these more technical awards, and then wondering, is that going to actually compete with the Revenant or Spotlight for the top honors? Seeing Spotlight win the whole thing, I thought was fair, as was the Revenant for the awards that it won. So, Christian, I'll turn it over to you first, because not only did you get to come over here and watch the Oscars with us for the later part of the ceremony, you also got to be on the red carpet working for Fandango for there. So can you give us just a little bit of insight into what that experience was like as a fan of movies like you are? Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, Fandango Movie Clips, they sent me to cover, and I was there and watching it as a movie fan. It's surreal. You can see all these people that, that for the work that we're talking about these movies all the time, and movies that kind of blew us away, and, and you know that some of these, uh, even if the movie necessarily didn't blow us away, the the uh, performance certainly did, and there was a lot of these great performers there. So it was it was nice to be there and then walking around on, on the show that I've watched every year. It was it was it was great. And we we talked to Henry Cavill and J.K. Simmons. J.K. Simmons said that I, that both myself and 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 Dan, the guy that I did the uh, interviews with, had screamable faces. So I liked that that very much. So, um, but that was great. And then coming back here and watching the show. Um, I, there weren't many surprises, and even because we were talking about it beforehand, and even though Stallone, I thought because he'd won so many, I I was saying it. If one person's going to beat him, it's going to be Rylance because that performance in that movie, which is an okay movie, um, he stood out, stole the movie from Tom Hanks. So I could see why he won for sure. Everyone else were, I think, kind of who most people predicted and I think well deserved like there wasn't anybody who won that was predicted that I didn't think I like Spotlight I think Spotlight was the one that should have won and it did yeah I think this was the year that if you were doing an Oscar pool where you won or lost was the technical like or the best documentary short subject kind of awards Dennis you were actually the one person on this panel that had the foresight the John Schnepp like vision <laughs> to be able to see Mark Rylance beating out <laughs> Sylvester Stallone anything else surprise you about last night uh, I think Ex Machina winning best visual mm. effects not that it wasn't uh deserve just I thought one of the bigger movies was gonna take that one um, not that it was a huge okay before the show if, if you had asked me who was winning best picture I would put I would say the Revenant and number two I'd, I'd say spotlight however during the show the spotlight only won one award which was best original screenplay and throughout the night none of its other nominated categories won and so there was no momentum leading up to it so at that point, when it was announced, it was a little more of a surprise for me. I will say the Leonardo DiCaprio winning uh, the Best Actor, even though pretty much everyone knew it was going to happen, there was still some tension there because everyone was thinking, and the audience and us included, as we we're watching, we we're wondering, what if he doesn't? Like right. we we're like, what if she uh, announces a different name? How are we all going to react? And then once they announced his name. Every, everyone here was clapping and yeah. cheering, and, and it was like, even though that was probably like a pretty foregone conclusion, where there was still a little bit of apprehension on our part. And it almost, I felt, took away from Spotlight's win in Best Picture, because after that happened, I think a lot of people were just like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then, and the, oh, oh yeah, Spotlight won Best Picture, by the way. Right, so Schnepp, you were honking Mad Max all weekend. You were That's very right. excited about this movie. It did win a lot of awards, and as the show went on, it looked like it might be stealing some of those big awards. Were you disappointed that it didn't? You know, I'm not. I'm not disappointed that it didn't because I think you know George Miller is used to working with a great team of people, and that most of his team won means that he won. That his. I was very happy that the best editing won. Margaret Sixel, the film is edited so tight and amazingly well. It was storyboarded incredibly well. All the sound design. Mark Mangini winning for sound editing and sound design. Just seeing all those kinds of costume design, all that stuff for the for that film to win all of those awards kind of almost makes it feel like it won Best Picture because it's just disassembling all the things that make a Best Picture and giving them Oscars for that. But then Best Picture actually gets Best Ensemble and Best Story. 
So it kind of worked out really fairly, so I wasn't angry at anything. Plus, those jello shots that Voika's wife made <laughs> were incredible. I think I had 10 of them. I went, the yeah. etouffee was really good. Yeah. The etouffee and the rice was great. I went full syringe on one of the jello shots. It's one of the many it's things on, you can check out online. on the Instagram feed. <laughs> and for more in-depth pontification about our overall thoughts on the ceremony, you guys can check out Collider Video's YouTube feed because we have our videos, our pre- and post-show recaps on there as well as the Instagram stuff in between. But if I can just get your gentleman's quick take on the entire Entire ceremony, Dennis. I want to start with you. How did you think the night went off as a whole? I, I think it went off great. I, I really enjoyed Chris Rock as the host. He's, he, he entertained me far more than the last several ones. Uh, I thought it was a bit longer, but at least the segments that they had to me were more entertaining than years past. So I, I really enjoyed this year's. Snap. Yeah, you know what? That Stacy Dash thing that was just incredible. Oh, oh man, my God. that was the only part I no, did I, not I had care to bring about. that up because there yeah. was a couple of stinkers in there, like really didn't work. But I thought Chris Rock really helmed everything really great. He, he made it funny by making the really serious, like, Oscars so white thing, making it funny and making fun of it so that we can all, like, breathe a little bit better and be like, yeah, it is kind of screwed up. Let's make sure we fix that. So I liked it. Yeah, I agree with you. I read some of the comments. I said, oh, it was too much. They did it too much. It had to be too much. Mm -hmm. for it's, uh, because he was <laughs> announced to be the host before the nominations, all that stuff happened. So then he did, he could have bailed on it and not hosted, but he decided to stick through it. And that was what he did. And I thought that it worked really well. I thought he was much better than he was last time. Um, and I'd actually like to see him come back. I'd like to see what, what he can do again. But the, the show itself for, I think that the people who won deserved to win and I thought it was a pretty good show. Yeah, look, the Oscars is a celebration of all things movies, but it always is it kind of wants to deem itself more important than just about make-believe stuff that we want to make real issues and messages during this ceremony. I thought Chris Rock was the perfect vehicle to do that, whether you're talking about if there are going to be protests or whether it was an entirely whitewashed Oscars or anything involved with that. Chris Rock did it with such a great dose of humor that I think it pulled the message off very, very well. Seeing Leo give a speech about climate change Change during his acceptance. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was a really nice touch as well. It didn't feel forced. It felt natural. Nothing about this ceremony last night felt like I was being beat over the head with a political message. I knew it was happening, but I enjoyed watching it for the most part. And I thought the Girl Scout cookies thing stole the night for me. So great job, Chris Rock and his daughters. Okay, kids. Well, it is Monday, so we do want to go over the box office report. This is brought to you by our friends over at AMC Theaters. Ashley, what did well this weekend? Well, it's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Continuing its domination at the box office, Deadpool was at number one in its third weekend in a row, bringing in $31.5 million. Taking the number two spot was Gods of Egypt with $14 million. Kung Fu Panda 3 took the number three spot with $9 million. Risen at number four with seven million, and at number five, Eddie the Eagle bringing in 6.3 million. The other wide release, Triple Nine, couldn't crack the top five, bringing in only 6.1 million. Schnapp, were you surprised by the box office numbers this weekend? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't get out to see any of these films this weekend, but I was bummed to hear about Triple Nine because I'm still looking forward to seeing it. I'm still psyched to see it, but I'm, I was hoping that you know a lot of other people would would dig it as much as I like the trailer. So that's a big shock for me. Um, yeah, for me, Eddie the Eagle deserved to do better. It, it really did. It was it's it's a feel good movie. I don't think people really knew. I don't think it was marketed great. I don't think a lot of people really knew about it. Movie fans did, but a lot of people like just a casual viewer did not know about that movie, and they should. I think it's a movie that's gonna be caught on cable or whatever it is. And people are like, that was really a movie. I wish I was seen that in the theater. Um, Gods of Egypt making fourteen million. Shame on anybody who. who spent, <laughs> I mean, shame on you guys for going to do that. Uh, that that is not that's not a movie that should be number seven, mm -hmm. more or less number two. Um, but look, who the hell knows how this? It's it's so crazy. I, I think I got pretty close in our top five because Kung Fu Panda sticking in there. There's really nothing for kids to see up until Zootopia comes out this weekend. Um, and then, yeah, Triple Nine. I'm curious because of everything going on in the world, if that's just not a movie people were really rushing out to see in the theater right now. Um, it's, you know, I, I, Hellcoat's great. I mean, I, I can't wait to see that movie. I actually missed it. But I just don't know, at a, again, from where we are right now, if that's a movie people are going to go spend money on right now. Well, I'm not going to say shame on you if you go see Gods of Egypt. Ah, if you pay $14, that's not a problem. If you're the studio that paid $140 million to get that movie made, <laughs> Shame on you. Dennis, you see these numbers. What stands out to you? Uh, I was way off on my box office predictions. Just, I had Eddie the Eagle higher up. I, I agree with Christian. It should have done a lot better. I, I did a triple feature on Saturday. I did triple nine, 
Eddie the Eagle and Gods of Egypt. Oh, you closed yeah. with Gods yeah. of Egypt. It just mm. the timing that's how yeah. it worked out. But <laughs> Eddie the Eagle was definitely the best out of those three. And I, I was hoping that it's a feel good sports movie. I thought I thought more people would go see it. Triple Nine. I, I kind of understand. I. I saw it. I liked it. I didn't love it like I wanted to. You know, you know, we had John Hillcoat in last week, and I love his movies. Also, I think the marketing for that for that movie wasn't that great. It didn't really tell you what it, it showed you the great cast that it had, but it didn't really convey what the movie was actually about. And I think that hurt it a lot. Yeah, I, I really like Triple Nine as well. I think you and I are probably the same mind critically for that movie where it's going to be a great watch on cable, if nothing else. And maybe people saw that and they're like, oh, this is an action movie I can check out once it gets to Netflix. I wish more people had seen Triple Nine because you're right, that cast alone is so good in watching them work together. But then I was thinking about it this morning when I saw the numbers come in. None of those cast members are going to open a movie huge. Casey Affleck's a phenomenal actor. Woody Harrelson, Kate Winslet's almost unrecognizable, but she is in the movie and she's very good for her scenes. But then you look at like She Would Tell Edge before. Norman Reedus, amazing on Walking Dead. Aaron Paul was great on Breaking Bad. But none of them have been proven to open a big movie yet. So maybe that was the problem with Triple Nine. It's a gritty action film. So out of all those movies, I didn't see Eddie the Eagle yet. I'm a sucker for sports movies. It's interesting that Eddie the Eagle, and then we also had another inspirational sports movie, Race, open not too long ago. And that also didn't do that well. At least, if nothing else from this weekend, you can take away that Deadpool is still crushing. I'm very happy. Happy to see Deadpool doing this well in the theaters. And The Witch, in its second week in release, I think was able to pull in another $5 million, which is a pretty nice hold from its opening weekend. So if for nothing else, witches have a reason so wait, to celebrate. I haven't seen Gods of Egypt yet. You guys all saw it. But you love the trailer. I love the trailer. It reminds me of some weird explosive Harry Hosen thing, and everybody's saying that's not it. No. Can you each of you just tell me in one sentence why you did not like it? Well, Christian uh, mercifully avoided that one. We drew straws to see who had to see Gods of Egypt and who had to see Out of the Eagle, and he won. Okay. So I saw Gods of Egypt, and it's like I didn't hate the story it was trying to tell. I just hated the way it was doing it. You're supposed to buy into the chemistry of the lead characters, and it just does not do that at all. Then when it throws a bunch of crappy CGI at you, then in some of these CGI scenes, you paid $140 million <laughs> for that? You got ripped off. Yeah, it was not uh, Dawn of the Planet Apes type of CGI <laughs> in there. Oh, it was um, not. Yeah, I like you. It actually the base story and kind of like the kind of lore that they're trying to tell is actually pretty interesting if it was executed well. But yeah, it's not only was the chemistry not there, the tone was kind of all over the place. Sometimes at the beginning of the movie, it starts off very serious, and then it goes into it gets really jokey, and then you couldn't really tell where it was at. And the whole like the the where the gods are giant and then the the the, peop the regular people are small. The, the the visual effects for that were pretty uh, bad. Yeah. yeah, and then they're inventing just new powers for the gods to have out of convenience every ten minutes. Like, yeah. oh, don't worry, I know someone that can go to the afterlife and say hi. It's like, well, what are you talking pa about? Perry was talking about Jeffrey Rush on a space boat. Yeah, like, yeah. Some, yeah. in outer space. Like, I want to see that now. I want to see that. So <laughs> it's, spin off. It, it, it's it's this <laughs> year's Jupiter ascending. All right, space they, boat they two. I'll see that one. Look like so. a grandpa space pirate, but he ended up looking like weekend at Bernie's in outer. Oh, that sounds good. What you want to see? Weekend at, at Bernie's in outer space. Ashley, tell us a good news story. Speaking of release dates, while Gambit struggles to get to the starting gate, Fox is moving forward on their <laughs> Alien and Predator films. Ridley Scott's Alien Covenant will now debut on August 4th, 2017, going up against Pitch Perfect 3 in theaters. The Predator, the highly anticipated movie with a script by Shane Black and Monster Squad director Fred Decker, will arrive in theaters on March 2nd. 2018. <laughs> Christian, thoughts on Alien and the Predator's new release dates? So, well, we're talking about Gambit here. <laughs> What's that? What happened to Gambit? Well, sometimes it it's, happens where we're going to skip ahead I a news story because Ashley can't where... wait to talk Alien and Predator. Um, Before I we get know. to those release dates, <laughs> we're going to tell you guys that there is some sad world if you're a huge fan of Gambit, that there's not actually a release date I'm for Ron him Burgundy? anymore. Is that right, <laughs> Ashley? You but, stay classy, um, San Diego. Yeah, well, um, go on and talk about uh, Gambit. <laughs> no, you you can give the read. I oh, mean, okay. It's, well, um, but you have to I don't do it really have accent. it in here. Oh, Dennis, what do you think about Gambit losing its release date? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how my notes are like this. Okay, yeah, guys. So, anyways, if <laughs> you guys don't happened? know, Fox released a schedule for this year, and Gambit is missing on that release schedule. So is Ashley's email. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> what they did announce that there's two Marvel movies that they have. They haven't said which ones they are, but they have uh, October 6, 2017 as a release date and January 12, 2018. So we'll speculate <laughs> about those. In terms of Gambit, not surprised at all. We've been talking about this for a long time. We're like, how are they going to get... This is a big budget movie. This isn't an indie drama where they can just kind of knock it out, like shoot it, edit it, and have it come out. <laughs> if they wanted to release it in like October, November of this year... They had, they had to start shooting yesterday, last month or whatever, yeah. because there's so much visual effects that needs to be done for these movies that there's no way that they would have gotten it done in time. And so it's not a big surprise at all. As, as far as those other two dates, we're, we're thinking probably, what, uh, uh, X-Force. X-Force and then maybe another X-Men movie, yeah. something like that. Uh, Christian? Yeah, yeah. Or maybe even something with Deadpool, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's well. With Deadpool, we know Deadpool yeah. Two is already coming out. So. It took the Fantastic Four Two mm -hmm. release. Later, yeah, so, so. I, I agree. I think that it's going to be a, a new X Men film, and it'll also be X Force for sure. And this is this is the Deadpool effect. I mean, this is yeah. this is them. This is Fox being smart. I hope and saying, look, this is what we did. We're able to do here with forty, sixty million dollars here. Why are we spending, including marketing, over two hundred million dollars on Gambit, which is not as a, much of a beloved property right. as Deadpool was, and we did that for far less? So let's let's kick back, let's let's make sure that we don't go forward with this because that will be a major loss in money. And I think it was smart. I think it was the fact that they came together and go, look, if we lose this movie right now, we can afford to lose this movie because we have the you know, the X Men, we have now a Deadpool kind of shared universe. If we need to do it as well too. And we have enough properties here that we can. We don't need Gambit. They needed Gambit beforehand. They needed it because Deadpool wasn't yeah. proven. They didn't know what it was going to do. So they had Channing Tatum, and they said, "Okay, big movie star." Now they're going. Let's not waste this money that we just made on Deadpool. So I think it's a really smart move. I think that if they do Gambit, they'll do it at a. At, they're going to cut budget on it, and, and we'll see it in like a couple of years. And he's going to swear. There's going to be all this sex, <laughs> uh, violence, rated R, break the fourth wall. I could not agree with you guys more. I mean, I think Fox. Just saved themselves a hundred million dollars because we were making fun of how much Gods of Egypt cost. Gambit was supposed to cost more than that before all the marketing stuff. And then when you see a movie like Deadpool, Christian, you're right. It was made on the cheap and it was done so well and the effects looked so good that it just you you have to sit back and say, wait, why are we doing this? With we know we got Channing Tatum, we know we got Doug Lyman, but we don't need to be spending this much money to make this movie, particularly when now we have all these other projects that fans clearly want to see. I also can't help but think part of this was look the reaction to Gambit getting cast. Channing Tatum, people love Channing Tatum. They're like, okay, that guy's playing Gambit? Okay. The name Doug Lyman, yeah, he makes great movies, but it didn't have that excitement that Deadpool had. As soon as it was announced that movie's gonna be rated R, people went crazy. Gambit, it seems like they were still a little more lukewarm on that movie coming out at all. I think it would have been terrific. I think it will be terrific whenever it comes out, but they're clearly putting their priorities behind X-Force and Deadpool and X-Men versus any other standalone movie. Yeah, I mean, for myself, I thought them picking Channing Tatum to play Gambit, setting it in New Orleans, great idea. When I heard the $150 million price tag, I was nice. like, what? What are you talking about? What kind of expensive space bar are you shooting this? In? I mean, 150 We're million. We're shoot it on the moon. I know right? they better be going to some different dimensions <laughs> with the mo mo you know Mojo and Modoc hanging out together. It's like I didn't under I just don't understand like how they could spend that much money, especially with tax breaks that they're getting. So whatever, it just seemed exorbitant. You see a movie like Deadpool, it doesn't look like a cheap film. Everyone keeps saying oh, it only costs 40, 50 million dollars. That's true, but it does not show on screen. Right. It feels like a real film. They didn't cut corners anywhere really except for like there's only two x-men and you know like hey you couldn't afford more x-men and they make that a joke so i think then pulling out uh, out of actually making gambit makes sense i know he's crying pepto-bismol tears but you know i think it, it makes sense in the long run i think i wonder if one of the because i've been bringing up that how the why the point break remake was as much <laughs> yeah. as it was and i think one of the reasons why is because they went to so many different locations i wonder if that was in the budget that maybe they had to, they were putting a lot of locations in there as well as you know p putting high pro price talent in there as well too that's why i just think they're going to they're going to look and go okay cut that cut that if we can do i think that they should shoot for doing a again 40 to 60 million gambit movie just tell if, if Tatum really wants to do it. Say, look, dude, either cut back on to do the same thing that, that Reynolds did. Take some price, either so, some points in, in the movie, and let's cut back on some stuff because there's no reason. 
looking at the comments. I don't care about Gambit. I don't care about Gambit. No one was saying that about Deadpool. Right. Deadpool. We need a Deadpool movie. That's not the same. It's not the same kind of hype. You've got to prove that Gambit is going to bring in audiences, and you have to do that with a smaller budget. I know how to bring in an audience. We're going to debut a new segment called Back to the Future. This is where we talk about a subject that we just heard about, then we went and talked about something else. <laughs> now we're going back to the subject that we um, had previously been forced to. I like this yeah. new segment. What are we talking like about? Um, well, I don't know which story you guys want me to go with. We but, are talking uh, about the We're hoping <laughs> Alien and Predator. This is a live show. Yeah. Okay, so we're going with... Um, the one you already read. The one I already read, all right? Ridley Scott's Alien Covenant <laughs> is now going to be debuting on August 4th, 2017, <laughs> and it's going to be going up against Pitch Perfect 3 in theaters. The Predator the highly anticipated movie with a script from Shane Black and Monster Squad director Fred Decker will arrive in theaters on March 2nd, 2018. Christian, once again, what are your <laughs> thoughts on Alien and the Predator's new release dates? Um, I think that they're good release dates. The only problem is that I think Dennis and I got tricked because <laughs> yes. I thought Shane Black was directing the Alien movie. I didn't know the Monster Squad director was directing <laughs> the new Alien movie. Now, it's clearly they have a relationship because... Shane Black wrote Monster Squad, but uh, but I don't know. I don't know about the director there. I I I would really like to have seen his Shane Black's di directorial vision of a new Predator movie. But you know he's writing it, so. But I think March is a good date for that movie to come out. I think that it's 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 not in the in the toilet bowl season in, in January, early February. It hits March where we're starting to gear up, and and especially now with all the comic book movies and the real estate is starting to go fast, like April, March. I mean, look this year, March. You got a big movie. I mean, you got Deadpool in February. So to to put something in March like that, I think is a good move. And then August is a great end of summer date for Alien. So I think these are good dates for both these movies. Yeah, you know, you hear Fred Decker, the guy who did Monster Squad, is doing Predator, and my first thought was, sweet, Predator has nards. Do we get that <laughs> line in the movie? You gotta think we will. Now, look, if you look at Alien coming out against Pitch Perfect 3, I wouldn't panic about that if I was in the Alien camp, because, yes, Pitch Perfect 2 did amazing business opening weekend, but critically, the movie wasn't anywhere near as well received as the first one was, so Pitch Perfect 3 is gonna have a lot to prove in its trailers and in the ads leading up to it to, to kind of mimic that success. With Alien coming out alien covenant people saw prometheus if they didn't love it they're at least intrigued by the world that it created as an add-on to alien when you throw the title alien back in there even if you're not going to show the xenomorph which i think is the wrong idea to do if you're not going to show the xenomorph calling it alien covenant is going to get people in opening weekend particularly in august i i'm with you christian i think the march release date for predator is so well done it's gonna it's not going to put a lot of pressure on it to be a tentpole summer release but we still get to see predator back in theaters Shane Black's vision is going to be there it's yeah. going to be a different guy directing it but you got to think they're going to be working pretty closely together so I'm a huge fan of both of these franchises or at least what the potential for these franchises can be yet again Schnapp, right, wait, are you excited you on board real quick I'm kind of confused because on IMDB it does say Shane Black is directing it mm -hmm. So it's just Fred Decker and him are writing it it says Fred Decker and Shane Black are, are writing it but directing it is Shane Black Hell, man. So. If Shane Black's directing it, that's, it makes me more excited mm -hmm. about it. Not yeah. that I'm hating on Fred Decker. He's you know, a yeah. good director. But Shane Black has really come into his own as a writer-director. So yeah. if that's the case, yay for uh, for Predator. Predator is in more dire help. It needs help more yes. than, than Alien does. I thought Prometheus, I like Prometheus. It didn't bother me that the, you know, the alien wasn't in there. It was like connected in some kind of weird fibrous way. But I'm excited to see Alien Covenant to move forward, keep that David character, go to the engineer's planet. I'm sure you'll see some version of the alien, uh, what do they call it, the ectomorph? The Xenomorph. Xenomorph, mm -hmm. whatever. It's like a morphing creature, cockroach monster thing. I want to see a mouth open, and I want to see another mouth come out of the mouth that just opened, and I want to see it dripping with goo. That's probably going to happen in that alien covenant. But yeah, I'm really excited. Especially for checking on the Predator thing, I think that character and that whole that whole world needs a it needs something better than Predators, which I was not a big yeah, fan of. Too. And I'm glad that they they're keeping these two franchises apart by almost a year because even though they aren't the same franchise, there's definitely a lot of crossover audience. Right. So you don't want something like Alien to come out one month and then two months later Predator comes out. You right. might get a little bit of fatigue there. And you don't want to confuse people by thinking, oh, we're setting up. Like, I wonder if Alien versus Predator would ever happen again in like a good way this time. But <laughs> I don't want to see that happen anytime soon. I like crossover a lot. I'm looking forward to seeing King Kong fight Godzilla. Yeah. But let's keep these two animals apart for a minute yeah. and establish them as a good franchise again before we see them fight each just other. Just one decade. That's yeah. just my and personal take. But somewhere down the road, we will do a buy or sell on seeing a new Alien versus Predator movie. That is not today, but it is time for buy or sell. Ashley is going to present us. 
with a topic and we simply say whether we buy it or sell it, then we will argue our point of view. All right, as the hype for Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice hits a fever pitch, Us Weekly is now reporting that Batman himself, Ben Affleck, would tweak the script while on set and dressed as Batman. The report also claims that Affleck wasn't thrilled with the script in question, so he would find the time on multiple occasions to tw- to rework it. Mark Byer saw the rumor of Ben Affleck reworking the Batman vs. Superman script. Yeah, you gotta love Us Weekly throwing in that, oh, he's dressed as Batman and he's working <laughs> on the script. This is the magazine that shows us where some celebrities are doing yoga and then heading to the coffee bean in your local neighborhood. I buy this, though, because I think it's Ben Affleck tweaking his lines as Batman. I don't think this is a situation where Ben Affleck comes in, puts on the tights, and then tells Zack Snyder what to do or tells him when to put Wonder Woman or Aquaman in the movie. That's my personal take. I think maybe they had creative consults with Ben Affleck as far as the direction of this movie and how to introduce the other members of the Justice League, but I don't think it's a situation where he comes in, looks at everybody's lines, and just X's it out with a red pen i think he probably had a large amount of say in what batman is going to be doing during this movie and the lines that he has but as far as the overall vision of this thing goes i'm not sure how involved ben affleck was in the writing of this script christian do you buy or sell this i'm gonna buy it but i think this kind of stinks for Zack snyder though because like here's the thing if the movie turns out to be super well written and it's a great story (laughs) you know because it's not nothing's confirmed people are just gonna go that's that's ben affleck Mm -hmm. you can see it but if it's not and it's not if it's not well written and it it comes off badly people are going to go well Affleck probably didn't have anything to do with it. it's probably all Snyder so I I feel bad for Snyder mm-hmm. in, in this story though too because you bring in a guy like Ben Affleck with Argo and the town all these movies that he that he's done uh Gone Baby Gone you, you see what he has done that he, for me I think he's a superior director over as far as storytelling when it comes to Snyder as far as visually Snyder's great visually but but I think that I it steals a little spotlight from him but I still think that it's it's you could see where you have someone like Ben Affleck he's going to give his opinions he's a big personality in general he's a producer as well too so he's going to if he has a problem with the script he's going to talk to Snyder about it and, and hopefully it, it seemed like it was probably a good collaboration I would agree I mean if the movie's great on the whole Zack Snyder's going to get the credit but if yeah. we watch that movie and we're like oh man the Batman scenes were great everything else sucked that's when Affleck yeah. is going to get all the praise probably unfairly so Schnapp are you buying this report yeah I buy and sell it I buy that he probably was somebody saw him in like his Batman suit like talking to like <laughs> oh what if I said this you know she is she with you you know it's like <laughs> whatever you know what I mean people fix change that's, good. Their, that's real yeah. good. Uh, we'll keep that let's uh, let's everyone have some will love it everyone has, will love it hey that's really good Batman <laughs> so I didn't say yeah. put in the trailer yeah. damn it. it's yeah. in the movie I just see Batman as like a WC Fields type character. Um, I think I think ben, ben Affleck probably rewrote a bunch of the stuff, but so what? Everyone rewrites stuff on movies. That happens all the time. All the actors rewrite their lines. That's just how it works. And it's not that big of a deal. And you're right, though. It's like if the movie sucks, people are going to be like, yeah, Affleck was trying to fix it the whole time, even while he was wearing the suit. Or if it's amazing totally Affleck yeah. fixed it while he was wearing the suit. I think it's a crappy, weird rumor that's probably true just because some people saw him doing that, right. sitting in the suit. He's like, once you get on that suit, he's like, the only time you ever take that suit off is to piss. You know what I mean? Or like, maybe they built that in like a still suit. I'm sure suit. they built that in. It's like a dune suit. I could shit in it. You know? It's totally cool. Hey, you got a shit flap? Yeah. yeah. yeah the shot. I don't even need a shit flap anymore. Just the suit eats it. Yeah. <laughs> we ever see Batman with trapdoor pajamas? Yeah. That's all we ever went out of like. I use my shit flap. Uh, yeah, I buy it, I buy it as, as well. I I, I, I love just love the image of Ben Affleck in the bat suit sitting there with a pencil just like yeah. fixing the little the spotlight, lines. little light. I also buy it too because he brought his his writer Chris Terrio onto the project before they already had a script. Zack Snyder, Snyder once they had Ben Affleck hop on as Batman, he brought he immediately brought his own writer in. Mm-hmm. So you know he's changing things up. But I, hopefully it's not the, like what you're talking about, like making those mass changes in terms of. Like all the the story and plot is just more like hopefully he just his lines. How do you describe Batman's trapdoor again? That's oh, my shit flop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bruce. Ashley, let's move on to our boy Sam Raimi. What's he all up right, to? Now that his work on Ash vs. Evil Dead is over, Sam Raimi is on to his next directing gig. Variety's reporting that Spider-Man and Evil Dead director will helm the feature World War III based on predictions from George Friedman's nonfiction bestselling book, The Next 100 Years. In the 2009 book, the author and renowned strategist predicts the future of our world based on existing intelligence and data that includes 
includes a new Cold War with new technologies that will change the way we live and fight our wars. There is no release date as of yet. Schnepp, do you buy or sell a World War III movie directed by Sam Raimi? Yeah, if it's directed by Sam Raimi, I'm buying that. I love Sam Raimi. I love uh, I love his take on anything that he's adapted or done. It's always fun to watch. Uh, he did a great job with Ash versus the Evil Dead. What a fantastic new series. Waited like how many, 20 years to see that? And it paid off. I mean, Bruce Campbell as Ash again. And uh, you got to thank Sam Raimi for doing it. So if he wants to rock World War III, that's something I'd rather watch in a movie theater than and ha have happen in real life. So That's what concerns me is, <laughs> that I, is how much I'm buying this because I'm excited to see this movie and hopefully it's one of those things where it comes out preemptively. So, hey, this is what our future is going to be. Let's try to change it. They're giving us the almanac from Back to the Future 2. Too. Let's make sure we don't make this mistake in real life. If I'm just watching this as a cinematic treasure, I think it's awesome. Sam Raimi seems like the right guy to be pulling this kind of movie off. Dennis, are you excited about this vision? Yeah, I'm buying it as well. Sam Raimi, I mean, we, we can write off Spider-Man 3 as sure. like, okay, that was yeah. just a misstep. Uh, I actually kind of enjoyed Oz, Oz the Great and Same Powerful. Uh, also, just reading about this, this book, because it's a nonfiction book, they're gonna have to create a story out of that. They need to create characters, a plot, everything. I mean, they have what's supposed to be happening within that world, which is kind of interesting. He's predicting that the United States and Britain, the Polish bloc, who else, uh, India and China are gonna be all on one side, and then they're gonna fight uh, Germany, France, Japan, and Turkey on the other side. And, and something about like, I guess the Soviet Union or Russia is gonna kind of dissolve and fall apart. He just has a lot of predictions that who, who knows if they're going to come true or not? Christian, it's a schmodown between countries. Are you yeah. buying it? I'm going to buy the movie, but if it's a buy or sell, whether or not it's actually going to come out, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is a risky, crazy movie that I don't know if... Uh, I mean, you, know, you talk about if they can go balls to the wall on this thing. I don't know if they're going to be able to because countries are going to get upset yeah, at this right. stuff. Like, like when it comes to... Especially some of our allies, if you're putting them on the other side too, because we have a pretty good relationship with Germany. Uh, so, like you know, <laughs> like if we're like, I thought we got past them. You know, so like, so to see what's going to happen in the movie, I'm curious about Sam Raimi doing it. Sure, like I'm also, I didn't love Oz, but I still it was it was better than certainly better than Spider Man Three. Um, but I I, li I really enjoy what he does as a filmmaker. So I want to see what he does with this. This is different for him too, but it's it's a it's a crazy premise. And luckily, it's Sam Raimi doing it and not Oliver Stone or Michael Moore making this movie, you know? So I think countries are going to relax a little bit when they see the guy from Drag Me to Hell and right. Evil Dead and all that stuff is doing this movie where he th there might be his his trademark uh, camp on there, some humor in there, so it's not going to be so, like, stone-cold serious. There's going to be some fun to be had with this movie, in my opinion, but it also is going to be a kind of a harbinger for what the future could be. Let's make sure that doesn't go down. It could down. be, it's a mad, 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 mad Kubrick. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like <laughs> the weirdest combination. That's what Raimi's like, I'm, it's kind of weird comedy, but uh, <laughs> you know? Yeah, you put Adam Sandler as the lead. There you oh, go. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly oh, could be happen. Well, crazy before war. we get to any other countries going to war, let's get to Mailbag. This is a segment of the show oh. where you guys get your questions on the air. Mailbag, how do you contribute? You just write us to collidervideo at gmail.com. We always pick out a few of your questions, and we want to remind you guys at the end of this show, we're going to be taking your live Twitter queries, so make sure that you guys tweet us at Collider Video. Ashley is the gatekeeper today, and she is so excited to see what you guys have to say about our here program thus far. <laughs> Ashley, mailbag, who's up? Kevin Rockhead writes, longtime watcher from London in the UK. I love all the shows you do and look forward to the schmoes being officially part of the family. Well, thank you. My question is regarding movies aging. I was following the Oscars ceremony on the Guardian newspaper website as they were tweeting regular updates as to what was happening. When in Uredu 1, one of the journalists commented that Birdman has aged badly in the past year, an opinion I totally disagree with. In your opinion, which movies have aged badly or not at all? And what is it that makes some movies age badly while others are almost timeless. The ones for me that age badly are the ones that tried to do too much with the effects that they had at the time. And while, and now as a more mature adult, I can watch the movie and appreciate it in its own time, but I still see effects. Like even when I watch those Raimi Spider-Man movies, it's like the effects are fine for the time, but I don't think that they hold up as well as the effects that you get today for obvious reasons. I'm gonna go back to a movie that I thought was so hysterical and fun to watch as a kid. And I saw it recently as an adult, and it's a film that we actually talked about already on the show today and that'd be Monster Squad. Like, man, I have fond memories of that movie and seeing all these monsters team up in this group of kids and they're on this scary horror mission and it's a fun time, right? Go back and watch the movie. 
There's a lot of language in there that I cannot believe, that I can't believe was in the script then or now. I guess maybe it's a sign of the times in the 80s, but there's a lot of stuff that should not be coming out of anybody's mouth at the very outset of Monster Squad. So if you go watch it again, just make sure your parents aren't in the room. Dennis, what's a movie that has aged horrifically in your opinion? Well, in, in terms of Birdman, yeah, I agree with, with him where I don't think Birdman's aged uh, badly at year. all. It's been a yeah. year. And I, I yeah. think the themes are bigger. I think a lot of people misinterpret that movie as like some sort of slam against superhero movies and I don't think that's it I think it's about uh, a person's ego and their validation validation of their existence and and just what he was doing Michael Keaton's character in that what he was trying to do in that was trying to you know uh, go with that theme uh, in terms of movies that haven't aged well I, I don't really think of like, like visual effects stuff, but I think about movies that at the time were, were really big, but they kind of have been not forgotten, but people don't bring them up as much anymore. And you, you're talking about something like a Shakespeare in Love, The Artist, Crash, Million Dollar Baby. I just feel like those movies, those, those all won uh, Best Picture Oscars, but I don't know how, how much people would be talking about if they hadn't won because other movies that have come either during that time or afterward are a lot more influential. Schnapp, what flicks in your library are showing their age? Hardly any. Uh, I've got an amazing library of films. <laughs> um, no, you know what? I have a, I have like a, like, you know, not films that I'm like, oh, it's, just, you know, I'm embarrassed to watch it. But, the, you know, they're like, you know, they're okay films when they came out. But the, being a science fiction nerd or a horror nerd, I have them and I love them for specific reasons. Like Saturn 3 is not the greatest film in the world. It's not even technically a good film, but it's, there's certain scenes in it that I love. But if you're going to talk about a film that like when I saw it, I loved it. And then maybe 15 years later, I saw it again. I was like, it's not as good. I hate to say it. Caddyshack. For me, <gasps> what? Turn his does, mic off. It does not age well. The humor falls flat, and a lot of it just doesn't work anymore. I mean, you'll always have Bill Murray as one of the funniest moments of that, you know, characters in that film. But the rest of it, I dare you to like laugh like you did when you first saw it. You, you take drugs, John? Yeah. I do. <laughs> Good. <laughs> You're dead to me. <laughs> you are dead to me, sir. Um, there's a couple, too. I, I see the thing, though, Dennis, the, the ones that you gave examples for, too, I think that even though they're not talked about as much, too, like I think if you went back and watched Million Dollar Baby, that's still a great movie. No, I think it's it still, still holds good. up. Those are all still good movies. Yeah. I'm just saying, you know, they won Best hype Picture. Hype-wise, yeah, I don't know if they still get the same hype, but yeah. as far as, like, being, like, that they don't hold up, like, if you watch them again, um, Cash Act definitely holds up. As far as, uh, I, I would say um, Tron was one for me. I loved Tron when I was a kid. Like, the effects are so bad, and the movie's not not the best. Look, I went back after MOBA was busting my chops for a long time for Zoolander, and I said, I'm going to try to watch Zoolander. And I, I was even watching it with my wife, who liked the first one, and she watched it again. I hadn't seen it so long. It does not hold up at all. The humor doesn't work the way it Whatever. does. Well, it you hated that movie fine. anyway, though. So, I did, but I was still you know. watching like because of the way, the, for the jokes that were made at the time, it, it's a dated movie. It doesn't work yeah. the same way, and plus it's terrible. Um, and then you also have <laughs> Jumanji. Um, if you Jumanji, I love Jumanji, but if you watch that now, you try to watch it, make a kid watch that movie, the, the special effects just for 95 or whatever it is too we've evolved so much it just it doesn't work yeah it's funny because you, you look at movies that are supposedly all-time classics and you go back and watch them and even if they're just merely good then we're a little disappointed i had that feeling i love sports movies to death the natural is just a movie i put on and i want to just get inspired the entire movie i like seeing robert redford i like him and wilford brimley's relationship i love the end scene i won't ruin it for you it's heroic but him and glenn close in that movie that is just like the most dead relationship they're just it's like two pieces of wood trying to make out i can't stand watching them in that movie i just want to get to the next baseball scene and now i'm just really upset about the caddyshack comment. Hey, let me flip it and just say what's a movie that has aged better like i when you mentioned uh, rob williams i thought of death to smoochie and and when it first came out oh, i didn't absolutely. like it yeah. and then i saw it like 10 years later i was like this is a a, a classic. It's yeah. an incredible it's, it's film. It's really funny. I yeah. love that movie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would throw a Dazed and Confused in there, too, because when it definitely. came out, I, I think it critically was received well, but it's just one of those movies that caught fire with audiences afterwards. And I saw it a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It just gets better and better every time you watch it. It's funny. I just watched it again like it's three so days good. ago. It's amazing. I know two movies, not that it got better, but just uh, Lawrence of Arabia and Godfather 2 that just don't age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can mm -hmm. you totally. watch those all the time. Rocky. Yeah. It doesn't age. Yeah. I was in Philly this weekend and. Yeah. 
had a lot of fun with Instagram. <laughs> Ashley, what's our next question? Alex Cavanis writes, hey guys, love the show. Been watching since Schnepp was just a disembodied head on a webcam. <laughs> it's called Skype, son. I was wondering who would you choose to give an honorary Oscar to for their career in film? An honorary Oscar for their career in film. So when I hear this, I can't help but think who has never won an Oscar where maybe they just weren't in one particular movie that they so totally deserved it. So we're just going to give them an award for their entire body of work has Harrison Ford already gotten an honorary Oscar because nope, if he hasn't so. the dude definitely deserves it he was nominated for witness he might have been nominated one other time but look it's Harrison Ford this guy has some of the most iconic characters in movie his it's not even limited to movies in pop culture history Han Solo, Indiana Jones, he was Jack Ryan. This guy so totally deserves, and it's probably the only way you can get him to show up to the Oscars at this point, is to say we're giving you a Lifetime Achievement Award. I can't think of anybody that deserves it more than that guy. Stallone. I give it to Stallone now. And look, you can laugh about it all just because he didn't win the Oscar. No, look what he did. How often is Rocky... Uh, it, it, is, it is a dream story for not only in, it, the, the actual story of it, but what it has done for people, for filmmakers, what it has done for p just in, individuals in general, that story of the, the underdog, and then to see him go that full circle. It would, that's why it would have been such a great story had he won last night overall. Now, whether or not he should have, it's another story, but he really did something extraordinary for in the world of film and for what he's done as a producer. And, and, and people take for granted also that what he did with Rocky, the way that he brought it back from Rocky Balboa, Boa, no studio wanted that movie. No one wanted to touch it. People thought he was nuts for doing that film. Saying, oh, like, literally, he, they had to, like, beg the same way he did for Rocky One after he was a major movie star. And he brought it back and he was able to kind of revitalize his entire career and other careers. And even Expendables aren't the best movies in the world, too, but he was able to do things with these franchises. I think that for an honorable Oscar for what he's done and the way that he tuned in to Rocky Balboa, that scene in the locker room, man, to have him come back, I think he's a dude that deserves it for his body work. All right. Well, my horse is the guy from Firewall. Christian took stop or my mom will shoot. Schnepp, who's the person that you think most? Most deserves an honorary Oscar. Well, if we're talking about actors, I would uh, give it to Michael Keaton off the, right off the bat. You know, Birdman last year, yeah. Spotlight this year. He's still Batman to me. I mean, he's got so many amazing roles. Beetlejuice. I can't remember his name in Night Shift. The character who's like, just feed me an ace to tuna. You know, like whatever that character was. He's got a lot of amazing, memorable roles. Um, I think he deserves something as far as an honorable mention in the next few years if he doesn't win it in the next couple of years because he's on a streak right now. He's going to be in another couple films that who knows if he'll win it in the next couple. But uh, director wise, I would throw it out to I would love to see John Carpenter get an honorary mm -hmm. Oscar. I think uh, a lot of horror films are over, o always overlooked as far as their impact and they're always kind of like shuttered and looked at as not real films or just trash or something and that's unfortunate because there's a lot of films that have stood the, the test of time and Carpenter's films Halloween they live the thing he's got a, a escape from LA it's the, not really escape from New York is the one I want to say <laughs> um, you know there's always hits and misses with directors and, and actors as well but I think his body of work stands the test of time and I'd love to see him win an Oscar I've got two people well, first one Gary Gary Oldman. He's only been nominated once, and that was wow. recently wow. for Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Damn. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's he's played a wide range of characters. Yeah. I mean, he's played what Drexel from True Romance, Commissioner Gordon, Dark Knight trilogy. Professional. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, his character in Professional. Lee Harvey Oswald in JFK. Uh, he's been in Harry Potter. He's in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. I think he deserve. He would if he doesn't win one. In the next, I don't know, just ten, the fact ten years, he had to get in all that makeup, put his hair in a weave, and act that well against Keanu Reeves. He should have gotten two Oscars mm -hmm. for just being able to stand next to that guy, and not break character, and yeah. be like, "I can't do this." Yeah, he was Zorg. He won. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Zorg in the Fifth Element. The go. other one I have is Roger Deakins, who you know, again, oh, yeah. he's been nominated thirteen times. He didn't win again last night for Sicario, and he's 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 been the cinematographer for some great movies like uh, uh, Fargo, Kundun, Shawshank Redemption, Assassination of Jesse James, No Country for Old Men, Skyfall, Prisoners, A Beautiful Mind. So like he's he's had some beautiful looking films just every time he's nominated he just doesn't win uh, dude is susan lucci with the lens okay well i told you guys we'd save some time at the end of the show for your live twitter questions we're about to do that right now ashley who's coming out of the gate first well jordan anderson writes who would you guys like to see host the oscars next year i can see louis ck hosting it mm. i think louis ck would be i i'm not a huge fan of of the concept of him hosting the oscars he's hysterical he's one of the best comics probably that ever 
ever lived and certainly working today. I just don't know as the host of the Oscars. Golden Globes. Y yeah, yeah, Louis C.K., I think I'd rather see him do what he did last night, which was one of the best parts of the entire ceremony. So as far as hosting next year, I, you know, they gave, I, I can't remember if Whoopi Goldberg actually hosted by herself or they did a comic relief thing one year. Whoopi Goldberg's hysterical, and she proved it again last night. I'd like to see either her or maybe Ellen come back and host it again. And if either one of them are not available, Oscars, please. You guys have my number. You guys know what my Twitter feed is. I'm happy to show up and host the goddamn ceremony. You're not going to get any controversy from me. Probably not. Let's let's get The Rock in there. I want to get somebody. I want to. I want to get somebody <laughs> brand new, man. I don't want to keep going back. Oh, oh, we're recycling the same comedians. Let's go, Ellen. Let's go. It's just. It's the same thing. Let's get some brand new people in there with some flair the rock has flair he's entertaining he's got energy like when we were at d23 that the, the panel we were at it was people were falling asleep the rock came out everyone was was excited he knows how to work a crowd from his days at wwe he knows how to do a live event the guy would be incredible as the host of the oscars not Chris the Rock. You're no, talking about the Rock. The Rock. Uh, I would say William Shatner. I went and saw him. Uh, I'm not even joking. I saw him do his li like his live show like two weeks ago. Won tickets to it, and it was incredible. He is such a showman, and I think he would be a fantastic host. I would go if they don't bring Chris Rock back. Steve Martin. I, I like when him and Alec Wal Baldwin did a kind of a co tag team. If, if maybe he did it solo. Uh, I think mentioned. I think John had mentioned this before. Kevin Spacey, I think, would be a, yeah. a good host as well. Yeah, and if you guys didn't know, Steve Martin actually returned to stand up, albeit briefly. He opened for Jerry Seinfeld because he lost a bet to him at the Beacon Theater a couple weeks ago. So first time that did, did stand up in a long time, and maybe we get to see him at the Oscars. If not, did he crush? Uh, dude, he's Steve Martin. Yeah. He murdered. You <laughs> yeah. kidding me? Ashley, what's next? <laughs> Dusty Pearson writes, along with the new shows coming, are there any changes coming to any existing Collider shows? No changes. I don't... Yeah, There's I mean, big changes. They're just getting better. What's yeah. up? Yeah, I mean... No, Walking <laughs> Dead came back. That was, yeah, yeah, but I mean, I think he means, are we going to like sudden... I remember... Uh, after the announcement happened, some people thought we were going to change movie talk, change the format. And no, no pretty much the format's going to stay the same. I mean, obviously, we'll make tweaks when we have to, but I, I don't think so. You, you might see, and you've already seen a couple challenges of people challenging each other for the movie trivia contest, but right. that's the little fun things here and there, but that's that's about I, it. I feel like we're just going to add on top of yeah. what we've already done. Yeah. yeah, if you look at it like the Food Guide Pyramid, we still have your basis of movie talk and heroes and Jedi counts and all that good stuff, and then we're adding all these other new shows. It's a very exciting time yeah. to be here at Collider well, Video. And for me, it's because the TV talk is something that I, I will be tuning into just as a fan because right. like I want to uh, like learn more about the news and stuff too and, and so if there's certain kind of reviews and things that are happening and the, what the streaming and stuff too that's just something that I thought as a viewer so like when we were talking about it, it's like what would we want to see on a weekly basis from a TV talk yeah so. and there's been so much good TV news yeah. like you got the Iron Fist casting you got Game yep. of Thrones coming Daredevil. up soon. Daredevil, Daredevil, Daredevil trailers yeah, yeah man our Daredevil season review is probably going to be 30 people because yeah. yeah. really yeah. everyone a lot wants more to do it right. yeah Ashley, what's next? Saba writes, what about a female James Bond? Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, can see that. I, I see. I don't know if we need a female James Bond. I think that this, to me, I'd rather have so, like a cool female spy on its own. Right. Like, I don't think you always have to just replace Ocean's oh, yeah. Eleven. You don't need to replace the <clears throat> Ghostbusters. Just make a cool female spy and give her her own thing. You don't have to be like, oh, no, that's that's Jamisa Bond. It's like, no, just just make her make her somebody else. She's, her name could be James. What? Yeah, I don't need her to know, be James or, or whatever it is. It's just, no, just, just let's do something different. Make a cool female spy. You want to give Emily Blunt a movie or Margot Robbie their own spy movie? Great. I'm on board. It doesn't even do James I want a female Doctor Who. That's what I want. You know what I wouldn't mind, though, is a spin off of James sure. Bond with a female operative. Sure, and why then, not? You know, that's tied into the James Bond universe. Yeah. Yeah, that could be interesting. I, I read the question as like just a female, like a James Bond ish. So, like, you could compare it to Bond or to Bourne, but it wouldn't necessarily be her, like, her name wouldn't be like Juliet Bond. That sounds ridiculous to me but yeah a female spy movie i'm totally on board for that but look i think ghostbusters I, I think it's the right thing to remake ghostbusters with an all-female cast because it's a it's a lot more singular of a concept to have people running around new york city busting ghosts in a humorous way than it is just to make a spy movie and put a female instead of a male in there so female ghostbusters i think is on the right track yeah 
Right. What's next? Tio Maslimata writes, what are your thoughts on the memoriam segment at the Oscars? Uh, look, I love the in-memoriam segment of the Oscars. It always brings a tear to my eye. I thought it was very, very well done last night with Dave Grohl covering the Beatles. It was the right way to go, that acoustic performance, having the, or or the orchestra kick in. I like that you some applause you could hear, but it didn't become that popularity contest that it used to, which was just flat out embarrassing on multiple levels. They closed it the right way with Leonard Nimoy. I like that they had his line, his classic line from Star Trek in there, closing that segment out. But guys, you missed Roddy Piper, man. How do you not put the star Roddy. of They Live in yeah. the In Memoriam segment? That's BS, man. They Snap. also missed Abe Vigoda, who's uh, in The Godfather. No he, in there. no, he wasn't. Are you sure? I am positive. Really? Yes. They oh, missed wow. Abe Vigoda. They missed Roddy Piper. They missed uh, Angus Scrim. And I know he's a smaller huh. role as the tall man from Phantasm, but hey, you're going to miss some of the smaller uh, people who are like only in a few films. But I mean, Abe Vigoda, come on. That was messed up. I liked it, especially now that they've combined the live performance song with the In Memoriam. Before, I don't know if you guys remember, a few years ago, they did, so they had the orchestra playing over the In Memoriam, and then they had another performance after that that wow. was supposed to be in respect to the In Memoriam. It's like, no, have the live <laughs> performance with the actual mm -hmm. pictures. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I feel the same exact way. <laughs> Just don't leave people out. Yeah. We love it. I mean, what else are you going to say about it? You gotta Stop it. trying to make us cry, but remember everyone. All right, Sebastian Fila writes, Zootopia opened in Uruguay two weeks ago and not opened it yet in the U.S. How do you take this difference on the release date? I don't know, man, but I can't wait to see those goddamn animals all together. They look hysterical. I want to go to the DMV with them. I want to go to the Popeyes with them. I, I want to live in this universe. Somebody on this panel has already gotten to see Zootopia. It's not me. I see it tomorrow night. Tomorrow afternoon, actually. Sweet. I'll be getting in to see the fox and the cute bunny even earlier. Christian, you've seen Zootopia? Is that correct? Yeah, I have. Can you, give us a, can, can you give us like a wink and a nod as to your feelings about it's it? It's a fun movie. It's a fun movie. It really, I, I enjoyed it a lot. It's, it's Disney's been doing it right, and Wreck It Ralph, and the Frozen, and then I th this, this movie is, it's, it's a lot of fun. Kids will love it. There's a lot of jokes in this movie that are just for adults oh, awesome. that will go right over kids' heads, and you, and especially you guys, you'll be like, there's some risky jokes in it, but it, but it works. But I think as far as the release dates go, no, I mean it's Disney's done this before. They've done it with Marvel movies, and now they're doing it with Pixar movies too. They release it, they release it early. They have confidence in their movies, and it's not like a lot of people are gonna be running around spoiling Zootopia. So, wait, where did it get released again? Uruguay. I was gonna say Uruguay. Ago, yeah. why, why Uruguay? Who knows? They're yeah, like, they we have market. the best IMAX there. You're like, all right, man. Oh, or like they're like Uruguay's the place where we test everything out and we find out what, like how audience are gonna respond. That's to what it. I'm more concerned yeah. about. Why Uruguay? You know. I was like, that's a weird one. Well, look, if you want to see Zootopia, you have to go to yeah. Uruguay. It's so a great book your for tickets now. Tourism? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Ashley, let's do two more. Okay. David Michael writes, hi, guys. What about a possible remake of the David Lynch classic, The Elephant Man? Um, they talked about it, didn't they, with, with Bradley Cooper? They talked about Bradley Cooper actually did oh, the, the Elephant Man on right, stage. Right, right, right. And so, I mean, you know, look, look, it's not the easiest thing for people to get their money together and go to New York or Uruguay, for that matter, to go see something <laughs> that's playing there. So if you want to do the Elephant Man again, I never really... I don't want to say never got into the Elephant Man because it's not like G.I. Joe, but I'm <laughs> not that aware of the Elephant Man or if it needs to go from the stage to the big screen again. Dennis, you have a take on this? You're not going to play with the Elephant Man like toy figure <laughs> right. at all? Uh, Gets in his elephant jeep. <laughs> Cobra and, Commander kind of had yeah. an Elephant Man vibe. And then, too. you know, are they going to do it in black and white as well? Uh, I don't think there's any need to remake it. That is a, an unbelievable classic film, and it's. Not, I don't think they're going to make a better film version of yeah. that story. Have you, have you guys seen? Have you seen the elephant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, the it's, movie that David Lynch made is incredible. Yeah, if you're not in tears at the end. You're not human. I don't think they need to remake it either. I have not. Sounds like a commentary <laughs> for a movie yeah. I haven't seen yet. Ashley, our last Twitter question of the day. Okay, Calvin writes: Who is the best actress right now? Brie Larson seems to be one to watch. Uh, she's definitely one to watch. She's on the radar. She had one of the best years you could possibly between her great performance in Trainwreck and then obviously winning the Oscar for Room. I think the best actress today, look, nobody's going to knock the street monster off the top of the mountain yet, but Kate Blanchett oh, yeah. is right there as well. She got nominated for Carol, and she, even though everybody was so singing Brie Larson's praises, you saw Kate Blanchett sitting there, and she just had that look on her face like, I'm not going to be surprised if they say my name. Jennifer Lawrence also. Jennifer Lawrence rolls out of bed, does a strange accent, 
and gets nominated for an award. So you got to throw her in there as well. But you're right. Brie Larson is one that's definitely on our radar now. Christian, the best actress working today. Uh, I'm giving it to I mean, best working today. I mean, how do you not put Streep as the best working today? But as far as up and coming and the ones to really watch that are going to be prime, Alicia Vikander, man. Mm. Like after seeing what she did in Ex Machina and seeing what she did. I mean, she stole the movie from from Eddie Raymond, the Danish, the Danish girl. So she, I think she is going to be one of the best out there for a very long time. That's a great call. Are we just so sick of Meryl Streep that we're unfairly wanting to give it to somebody else? Like when they gave Carl Malone the MVP over Jordan that year? No, I mean, Meryl Streep is always knocking it out of the park. She's in, every film she's in, she's amazing. I would, I'd echo Kate Blanchett. I'd also say from Sicaria, uh, Emily Blunt is an incredible mm -hmm. actress and I love everything she's been in. I can't wait to see Blanchett take on a, a Lucille Ball. Like, that's the biopic that I cannot wait to see. So. I thought they were going to fight for me. I was like, wait, what? That's awesome. That's for me, it's Kate Blanchett. I mean, if she's in a movie, then I, I want to see it no matter what it is. Uh, Meryl Streep, yeah, obviously, she's she's the big one. I, I think lately, though, I mean, she got nominated for Into the Woods, you know? Like, yeah. I, that was kind of a gimme, you know? Like, I, I, she was great in it, but was there something Oscar-worthy about that performance in particular? It, no, and neither was there for Ricky and the Flash. I think yeah. she got nominated for a Golden Globe in that or something, just yeah. because, again, it's Meryl Streep. But look, we get it. You're the street monster. We all bow down before your greatness. Uh, I want to thank everybody here in the room for helping us pull off this edition of Movie Talk, which was just jam-packed with a lot of interesting stuff. Let's thank the panel first, though. Dennis, where can the kids find you? You can find me on Twitter, at ThinkHero, on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And yeah, keep watching Movie Talk, and you'll hear more about uh, the shows we talked about earlier. Schnapp! Hey, you can find me uh, just uh, on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnapp. You can get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, TDOSLWH.com. I'd like to thank John Campia for Skyping me in all those years ago. <laughs> Christian George from the red carpet to our own homes. Where can they find you? Well, check out my new comic book coming out, Shit Flap. Uh, it'll be on the stores pretty soon. Uh, no, make sure you find me on Twitter and Instagram at Christian Harloff, as well as Facebook. I'm just starting to do a lot of the Facebook Live stuff that I put some of the Oscar things as well. And Jedi Council every Thursday. Myself, Mark Ellis, John Campia, and Tiffany Smith will all be talking this week. Star Wars stuff. Shit flap. The Brown Knight returns. Oh. Ashley, where can the kids find you? Yeah, on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. It is it Monday. Was. My name is Mark Ellis. Thank you guys so much, everybody behind the desk. Jonathan, Adam, Ray, wherever the hell he is, Wendy, wherever the hell she is, I'm Mark Batman. Riley back there too. I'm Listen, guys, there's a lot of great movies that are playing or will be playing at AMC Theaters, so make sure you guys check them out for all your showtime. Ticket information at amctheaters.com. Bookmark collider.com because that's where you should go to get up to date on all the latest goings on in the world of movies. And of course, subscribe not only to Collider Video, but also to Christian and I's movie channel, Schmoes No, officially part of the Collider family. My name is Mark. You guys can find me on all the social media outlets it's at Mark Ellis Live. This weekend, I'm actually in town, so I'll probably be at the Comedy Store right here in Los Angeles, California. That's all for us. Until tomorrow, see you next time. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.